I'm going to take you through the three ways and then talk a bit about what's happening in different countries in use of evidence synthesis and finally conclude with some general lessons from, from evidence synthesis. So the first wave of the evidence revolution was new public management and the results agenda. This was particularly strong in Anglophone countries, in the US and UK, in Australia and New Zealand, and is particularly well known for its adoption by the Clinton and Blair governments, for example, the modernising government um, white paper in the UK in, in um, 2000. And an important thing that the new public management brought to bear was a shift from monitoring inputs to paying attention to outcomes. So it really is the case when I started my career back in the 1980s that when people were looking at development programs and how they're done, they really were concerned about how much money they'd spent. Have we spent all the money? And as far down those go down the causal chain would be have we bought all the Land Rovers we said we're going to buy? Have we hired the consultants we said we're going to hire? And measures of project success really were that level. And so new public management shifted the focus to outcomes like unemployment, poverty, women being empowered and so on. And so this shift to focusing on outcomes was very important and the international development targets, the predecessors of the Millennium Development Goals were one recognition of the importance of focusing outcomes in the, in the development community. So this, as I've mentioned, this, uh, this agenda was adopted in the UK and the US and I'm going to talk a bit about the US and UK experiences in relation to international development programs in particular. So here is a um, quote from the UK white paper modernising government from, uh, from 2000, uh, 99, 2001 or two. And what they said here is the government wants to ensure the effectiveness of services. So it is about delivering effective services, the sort of talk that we talk today. And how they're going to do that, they're going to do it through what were called public service agreements. So what were these public service agreements? These public service agreements were lists of performance targets. So here's the list for DFID, the UK Development Agency, Department for International <coughs> Development, and they're saying, well, um, that they're going to get 75% of their bilateral aid program going to the um, low-income countries, and in the 30 largest recipients of DFID assistance, you're going to see higher growth, uh, more reduction in under five and maternal mortality, and more children going to school. So these are outcome level targets for the recipients of UK development assistance. Now, in, and this is the performance target from 1999-2002. So interestingly, the USID had been down, so the US and the USID in the US had been down the same road. So the Clinton government was a big supporter of New Public Management too. And in 1993, you had the Government Results and Performance Act. And uh, the GRPA required all US government agencies basically to have what we call now a results framework. It's an outcome, outcome framework for their program. So we look at USID and how they responded to GRPA. They had six strategic development goals. Uh, for example, broad-based economic growth and agricultural development. And for each goal, they defined indicators at country and global levels. So for example, they would look at annual average growth rates and real per capita income above 1% would be um, a goal set against this strategic um, development goal of, of growth and agricultural development. So for example, in their 2000 performance report, they reported that nearly 70% of USID assisted countries were growing at positive rates in the second half of the 90s compared to less than half in the first half of the 90s. But in that performance report, where they're reporting, supposedly, on their, report, their performance, what results they have achieved, they do note that one cannot reasonably attribute overall country progress to USID programs. So we're measuring our performance by indicators actually we don't have control over which doesn't really seem to make much sense. Okay? And this is the main problem of outcome monitoring. If you just monitor outcomes, those outcomes change for many reasons. You cannot use outcome monitoring to, to, make, to figure out your performance because other, those outcomes may change in the absence of your interventions. So the General Accounting Office of the US that was overseeing these performance agreements wrote a letter back to USID basically saying we're not stupid. 
Okay, uh, what, the exact words were a bit more technical, but what they're basically saying is we don't buy this. We don't think that these performance indicators are measures of your performance. And USID, in fact, abandoned the use of these strategic indicators around the same time DFID was starting to use them. And later on, during that decade, the first decade of this millennium, many other agencies started to use outcome monitoring like the Dutch and produce so-called results reports where they would plot the result enrolment rates in, in Africa and say, here are our results. A little note at the bottom saying, but you can't attribute these results to Dutch foreign assistance. So actually, these results reports are not telling us the results at all of what these development programs are actually achieving. That, this doesn't mean monitoring is not important. Monitoring is important, and it gives you factual data on what happened, and that can be useful to know. So here's an example from the Government of Uganda annual performance report. And they have various performance targets. And they see basically using a traffic light system, are we on, on target to meet that performance indicator or not? And if you've got a red, so you're not on target, you, know, you need to pay attention to that. So it's sending a warning signal. What you need to do to address that problem, then you need to know which programs are effective. And this doesn't tell you. Monitoring tells you there is a problem. It doesn't tell you what to do about it. Okay, so there's a role for monitoring, but it's not. I was looking at one particular case of vitamin A where they're falling badly below the target. I can't actually read it on here. So the target is 66% and only around uh, 20, 20, 29% or something. And so they're falling below the target. They need to do something, but what to increase vitamin A uptake? It's a supply problem, it's a demand problem. They need to figure that out with evaluation. So what do we do? How do we figure out which programs make a difference? We do that by using rigorous impact evaluation, preferably a randomized controlled trial, which allows us to construct a valid counterfactual. As Pierre mentioned, a commitment to establishing counterfactuals has been a theme throughout my work, from my work on age effectiveness in the early 90s or late 80s, through to work on systematic reviews today. Having valid counterfactuals is a key component of understanding what difference you have made. You cannot understand what difference you have made if you don't have a counterfactual of what would have happened in the absence of what you're doing. And the best way to establish these valid counterfactuals are randomized controlled trials. Now, this is a realization that happened not just in development, it happened across all sectors. Remember, in the UK and the US, all sectors were being told to demonstrate results. They produced results frameworks that reported on these results, and then they were told by GAO in the US and by NAO in the UK, what you're telling us doesn't tell us what difference you've made. We want to know what difference you've made. And so what we saw, see is wave two of the evidence revolution, the randomization revolution. And from the early 2000s, we start to see a rapid rise in randomized controlled trials. This is the number of trials published in social work in developed countries, and you see from the early 2000s, the sharp rise in the number of RCTs being published each year. This is the same in education, come to the Institute of Education Sciences database. The tailing off is because they haven't updated with more recent publications. You see from the early 2000s a rapid rise. This is impact evaluations, um, all designs coming from the 3i database. And again, you see this takeoff coming, it's more steady growth, but coming around 2000s, early 2000s, a more rapid rise. And finally, in analysis of labour market research, the dark figures are RCTs, the grey are different designs. Again, early 2000s, there's not much before that. Then you see this rapid growth in impact evaluation. So across sectors, you see this rise in rapid impact evaluation coming from the early 2000s because of the realisation we cannot tell what difference our programmes are making using existing monitoring or evaluation techniques. We used to use counterfactual based, te based techniques to do that, and it's happening around the world and it's happening in growing numbers. It's a very positive development. But the problem is we can't use these single studies that are being done to actually inform global evidence. If you ask me, does a particular program work? What programs are most effective from, for, uh, for tackling violence against women and girls? I'm not going to look at a single study from one particular place and say, oh, this works, you should do this. I'm going to say, what does the body of evidence say? Let's look at the global body of evidence. And there are some ex some, several examples we have of why you shouldn't just look at single studies. <coughs> so one example is mandatory arrest. 
Their mandatory, mandatory arrest is where, when the police are called to the case for suspected domestic abuse, they have to arrest the perpetrator, the suspected perpetrator, regardless of what they find on the scene. And a trial, randomised control trial, done in uh, 1984 in Minneapolis in the US, found that mandatory arrest halved the re-abusing rate compared to simply removing the perpetrator temporarily from the home. And on the basis of that trial, which was featured very prominently in the media, now, 20 years, well, 20 years later, three quarters of all police departments in the US have mandatory arrest programs. The problem is that actually five further trials of this program in five other US cities did not find the same results. Actually, in two cases, it found mandatory arrest led to worse outcomes than alternatives. And the authors of the original Minneapolis study said, we never thought that we should actually expand this program based on our study. We call for a repeal and mandatory arrest. You can't rely on single studies. <coughs> Nurse Family Partnership. This is a home, what's called a home visitation program. They're very popular in developed countries and starting to become more popular in developing countries. So a health visitor or a social worker comes to the home to advise, counsel the parents on basically childcare, nutrition and so on. Nurse Family Partnership was started in the United States and um, it's targeted at poor disadvantaged mothers during pregnancy in the early months and years of a child's life to have these health visitors go to the, ch go to the home of the, of the uh, child and give this, give this advice. This place, uh, page, page I have here is actually from the Australian Nurse Family Partnership where they now do Nurse Family Partnership in Australia. And on this page they have saying what's the evidence for Nurse Family Partnership? It's, it cites three studies from the United States carried out in the 1970s, 80s and 90s. What they don't report here actually is a more recent study published in The Lancet last year carried out in the United Kingdom that showed nurse family partnership has no effect. Why does it have no effect in the UK? The most likely reason is actually what's happening with the control group. If you're a young, poor, disadvantaged mother in the United States, you don't have access to health insurance, you can't afford health care, you have the control group gets very little. Now this is an example of fairly standard design where the control gets a standard treatment of care. They can use whatever the existing services are. And in the UK, you have the National Health Service. And National Health Service provides free antenatal care, free hospital-based delivery, you get a birthing kit to take home with you, and a health visitor comes and visits you every week in your home to advise you on, the up, on raising your child. So that is Nurse Family Partnership. The control group gets the programme. So it's not surprising the programme makes no, no effect. The context matters. You can't transfer from one context to another context. You have to pay attention to the context, which in this case means what's happening to the control group. And finally, and most controversially, deworming. So, there's a deworm the world campaign based primarily on a well-known study carried out in one district, in one part of one district in Western Kenya. And that deworm the world campaign has led to the Kenyan government, but also the Indian government, adopting national deworming programs. India has in February National Deworming Day, and several states have statewide school-based deworming programs, supported by international donors like Evidence Action, Evidence Action and SIF, the Child Investment, Fund, Fund, Child Investment Foundation Fund. And on their websites, they say, we support the deworming programs because the global evidence shows that deworming programs improve child health, nutrition and education outcomes. It is not true. That is a lie. Okay? There are a couple of studies that show that from Africa. There are 12 randomised controlled trials from India that show no impact whatsoever. There are nearly 60 studies from around the world, all but three of which show no impact on nutrition and health and education outcomes. Deworming reduces the worm burden, but it has no impact on any other outcomes of interest. Okay, and so it's been good to know why these three African studies are different, but you certainly should not gl base global policy on three studies exceptional to the weight of the evidence that shows something totally different. So we shouldn't base global policy on single studies. What should we base it on, everybody? Systematic reviews. So the third wave of the evidence revolution is the rise of reverence, rigorous evidence synthesis. Okay? And what is a systematic review? It's a systematic approach to summarise results from all relevant studies on a particular question. 
that should, if it can do, if it is a systematic review of effects, contain meta-analysis, which looks at the average treatment effect and examines variations in effects. It includes primary studies, which are the individual studies, which in the effects re effectiveness review, effectiveness reviews look at the effectiveness of different interventions, should be impact evaluations, particularly randomized controlled trials. And they're done in a systematic way. Many of you here are attending the workshop we're doing. So you've seen this. You've actually seen most of what I've been talking about uh, so far. There's some stuff, new stuff coming. Um, where you have systematic screening, systematic coding, systematic synthesis, systematic reporting, and then engage with policy and practice. It's a systematic process that avoids all the biases that traditional literature reviews have. And if you, when you become a systematic reviewer, you will suddenly start to realize the traditional literature reviews are biased. If, if you were to take one of my areas of, of expertise, say anti-poverty programs, and commission me to do a literature review, don't bother. Just ask me what I think already, and I will tell you what I think, and that's what I will say in my literature review. People don't change their mind when they're writing literature reviews. They write what they think already, and they pick the evidence to support that argument. So there's no point in that. And it might be interesting to read, but you want to know actually what the evidence says, you need a systematic review that overcomes those biases by ensuring you find and include and summarise all relevant evidence. <coughs> so what we would like to achieve is this evidence-driven project cycle, policy cycle, and practice cycle. So if we start at the top, we should consult the evidence base to inform the design or redesign, reform the policy programmes and practice, and then we test those in the local context and then we pilot them for efficacy studies, do a larger scale eff effectiveness trial, and then we keep rolling out to new, new populations, new contexts, new designs, and then we synthesize all the evidence across all the studies to build and strengthen the evidence base, and we go around again. The fact is that mostly we're doing better on the right-hand side of the cycle, the, the, the red and the uh, green and the whatever colour that is, dirty brown, but we're doing left, less well on the left, and this consulting the evidence base is done somewhat haphazardly, haphazardly. but it's done better in some places than others. It's done best of all in the health sector, the actual institutionalisation. Not you can find a case here or there where evidence has been used, but actually the use of evidence from reviews has been institutionalised. So it's best in health, particularly in developed countries, and that's led by the World Health Organisation. The World Health Organization produces lots of guidelines. It's recently revised its deworming guidelines, for example, and many countries around the world follow the, they incorporate WHO guidelines into national policy. And the WHO guidelines on producing guidelines says that WHO guidelines must be informed by high quality systematic reviews. So they're evidence based guidelines. And that's taken down to the national level, for example, in the UK, where the National Institute for Health Research, it funds Cochrane Groups, Cochrane is the health counterpart of Campbell, and it funds reviews of relevance National Health Service, and it gives um, awards to accelerate reviews. If there's a particularly controversial or relevant issue, they get the review done quickly to inform the policy decision. And then the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK uses reviews for guideline production, same as WHO, and for the eligibility for National Health Service resources. The NICE decides what NHS money, NHS money can and cannot be used for based on systematic review evidence. So this is really institutionalising use of evidence from systematic reviews. Now the language of evidence is spreading to all different sectors. So you have evidence-based nursing, it's health, there's an evidence-based business book, you have evidence-based teaching, um, evidence-based art therapy, evidence-based, I can't read that one, uh, social work, evidence-based policing, evidence-based sports speech agility. You even have evidence-based cookbooks. <laughs> okay, no, seriously, it has evidence period with systematic reviews at the top and talks about different ways to cook to actually are better for you nutritionally. So evidence has really spread across all different sectors. So how is it being institutionalised in different countries? There are cases where it is, and mainly in developed countries. So in the UK, these what work centres have been developed. The World Work Centres um, are things that are funded by government in the big lottery, and they both commission reviews primarily, but the largest ones also commission primary studies, impact evaluations, randomised controlled trials, and they cover well-being, crime reduction, ageing, um, I can't read that one, probably local government, and there are regional centres in Scotland and Wales, and one coming in Northern Ireland, um, and the biggest of these is the Education Endowment Foundation, the What Work Centre for Education. 
So EEF has funded randomised control trials in over 500 schools. If you had gone back 10 years, you would have been told, oh, you can't do randomised control trials in the English education system because the unions won't allow it because it's decentralised. Now, a few months ago, the millionth student was involved in a randomised control trial. Now, nearly a third of all primary schools in the UK are involved in randomised control trials. So there's been an enormous spread in testing different interventions through funding from EEF in the education sector. And this data from all these trials are synthesised into the evidence portals. And I'll go on to the evidence portal. They've got two portals, one on early years toolkit, early years development, and the other is a teacher and learning toolkit which I don't have a slide of actually, but I should have this one I'll talk about more. So in the, in the toolkit, there are a list of different interventions that you can do, and then the symbols correspond to pounds. One pound is cheap, five pounds is expensive, and not, not literally five pounds, but more pound symbols means it's more expensive. And then the locks correspond to the strength of the evidence. Most importantly, the final number is the impact. And the impact is measured as the month's additional child development, cognitive development, the child gets from being exposed to that intervention. In the teacher and learning toolkit, it's the month of equivalent learning a child gets. So you get a plus four, it's like getting additional four months schooling if you're exposed to that intervention. The nice thing about this evidence portal is it's very user friendly. You can click down and read more about the intervention, you can drill deep and read more about the evidence, but for most people involved in early year development, or most school managers, they want something very simple like this. So the teacher and learning toolkit, which I don't have up here, has 34 different interventions with the same system of money, strength of evidence, and impact. And, and a study by the UK National Audit Office showed that the increase of the teacher and learning toolkit by school managers went up from a third in 2012 to two thirds in 2015. Two thirds of school managers are using this evidence-based portal to make spending decisions in their school. That's, that's enormous. Two thirds is a really big number. Okay? Why, why do we see that success? It's because of this supply and demand for evidence. The supply for evidence is here in the evidence portal in a very easy to use way, in a way that's understandable by teachers. The demand side is every school in England gets what's called the pupil premium, which is a capitation grant depending on the number of disadvantaged students in the school. And school managers are told, use the money as you wish in a way that will improve learning outcomes of disadvantaged students. So where are they going to find out what to do? They're going to turn to the teaching learning toolkit. So you get this combination of supply and demand driving up this demand for evidence and it's being supplied in a usable, accessible way. Um, in the United States, you have something very similar to what works clearing houses. Again, the one for education is the biggest. Um, they have also clearing houses in, la in, in, uh, in labour and in uh, crime reduction and in child, uh, child welfare. There's also in the US um, Moneyball for Government, which is an advocacy programme that promotes the use of government in states and cities and so on by encouraging the adoption of evidence-based programmes. They have a list of evidence-based programmes that states should adopt. So there's both pushing for, to increase the demand through Moneyball, but we have a supply of evidence coming through the clearing houses. I'll skip the last bit. And finally, the Nordic model. I love the Nordic model. Okay? The Nordic model brings together the alignment of supply and demand by having government-funded research centres. So in Norway, in Sweden, in Denmark, you have a Knowledge Centre for Effective Education, basically different names in all three countries, and Knowledge Centres for Social Welfare, different names in all three countries. And they have staff in those Knowledge Centres whose job it is to write systematic reviews. I mean, what a great job. Who wouldn't love that job? Yes. So they go to work every day, and their job is to write systematic reviews. And their work programmes are determined twice a year. They meet with relevant government departments and decide what their priorities are for those different departments, and that determines the reviews they'll do over the coming year to meet those policy demands, and they're used to inform policy and guidelines and so on. Here's a list of some of the different centres. Um, so let's take an example, the Knowledge Centre for Education in Norway. The minister said he's concerned about school dropouts, that students don't finish school, and so the staff of the Knowledge Centre in Norway, they took the camp review on the dropouts, and they updated it, and then they said to the minister, well, there are eight different interventions that seem to work in reducing dropouts. Of those, two seem most applicable in Norway, and now they're trying them out in Norway with randomised control trials. 
Because if you go back to the project cycle, evidence-based policy is not a blueprint approach. You look at the global evidence, you see what sort of effective programs seem applicable in your context, and then you should uh, adapt those and try them out. So if, if you're tweeting evidence-based policy is not a blueprint approach, that'd be very popular. You should tweet that. Yes. Okay. Um, must have some other things as well earlier, but that that'd be a good one. It'll go down well. Um, so that's looking at the general international experience in developed countries, how use evidence is being institutionalised. You will not find anything similar in de any developing country to date. Okay, I'm pretty confident about making that statement. I think there's institutionalisation of in the second wave, particularly in Latin American countries, and using impact evaluation, but moving to the third wave, systematic review evidence, I don't think it's there. Okay, finally some general lessons from the systematic review literature to date. The first lesson is most things don't work. The 80% rule, 80% of things don't work. Um, in, in the private sector, 80% of businesses fail in the first five years, a stylized fact. So do we think that public sector programs will do any better? In the business sector again, and this is an old number, Google and Microsoft conduct 13,000 randomized control trials. The private sector is far ahead of the public sector in doing randomized control trials. And of those, 80 to 90% found no significant effects. Most things don't work. The Institute of Education Science in the US did randomized control trials of 90 interventions. 90% had weak or no effects. In labor, 75% had weak or no positive effects. So most things don't work. This is why it's so important to do rigorous studies to see if things work or not. There are countless examples of things that seem to work if you use an outcome monitoring approach. When you use a counterfactual, you find they don't work. Most things don't work. And when they do work, effect sizes are small. Most things don't have very big effect. The program that's going to end poverty, that's going to empower all girls and women, these programs don't exist. Okay? The effects actually generally are very small. Um, in systematic reviews, we consider small to be 0.05 to 0.2. And I don't give the uh, effect size there. But as far as uh, welfare to work programs, we've got 46 RCTs. And employment at follow-up was 61% in the treatment group compared to 58% in the control group. So a difference of 3%. It's not a huge effect. You went to a politician and said, wow, you can actually increase employment amongst this group of 58% to 61%. They would tell you to go away. Stop wasting their time. I want to, you know, it's 58% now. I want it to be 100%. It's not going to happen. But actually, most politicians think that programs, but effectiveness means it has totally effective. It doesn't happen. So these numbers, you need to treat 33 unemployed people to get one person into work. Okay, that doesn't sound very cost effective. So just a side note, these unrealistic expectations effects create underpowered studies all the time. And there's a picture of a man with some cows to prove it. I don't know why that's there. <laughs> um, so actually, I talked a bit more about underpowering. Underpowering is a really big issue. This is when you do a study, the sample size is too small to be able to actually find a positive effect when there is one. You reduce the likelihood of finding a positive effect. So we aim normally for power to be 80%, which means there's a 20% chance you will not find a positive effect when there is one. But in reality, many studies have a power of only 50%, which means that there's a 50% chance of not finding an effect when there is one. That means if the program is working, you may as well toss a coin as do an RCT. It's much cheaper, has the same probability of finding the right result. So underpowering really matters. And a recent paper established in the Economic Journal showed that the, mean, the median effect, the median power of over 60,000 estimates for effects in economic papers was 18%. Not 80, 18%. So underpowering is a huge problem. OK, so most things don't work, but some things do work. So we need to exploit heterogeneity. Remember when I was talking about meta-analysis, and I said meta-analysis should look at the variation in effects and explain the variation in effects, not just do an average treatment effect. Many people, people who are wrong, say, oh, you can't do systematic reviews of development interventions, social interventions, because there's so much heterogeneity. The program designs are different, the population is different, and so on. I say, it's great, bring it on. Heterogeneity is the friend of meta-analysis, not its enemy. You can tweet that too. Go ahead. So, so because the more variation there is in the effect size, the more you can dig down and see well, what's explaining those variations. Unfortunately, in the one we can't explain the African 
re results. But that's unusual. Conditional cash transfers, we know from having many, inclu many included studies, many impact evaluations, that the size of a transfer matters, the timing of a transfer matters. It's more effective at primary, secondary than primary. That if you put conditions on learning outcomes, not just attendance, it has more effect. And monitoring the enforcement of conditions matters. Conditions matter, and monitoring enforcement of conditions matters. That's a lot of really rich design, useful information coming from systematic reviews, because we have lots of studies, and we exploit its heterogeneity. The example I use normally, and we use now, is mergers and acquisitions. Mergers and acquisitions are one of these things that fall to the 80% rule. 80% of mergers and acquisitions are bad for the bottom line of both the acquiring company and the acquired being, company being acquired. But Cisco tripled its profits through 60 mergers and acquisitions. How did it do that? It said 80% don't work. They're bad for you. That means 20% are. Let's identify the characteristics of 20% that do work, that do make money for you, and let's do those. The problem is that they had a database of 9,000 cases. Most of the reviews include 10 or 12 papers. So our, our opportunity for exploiting heterogeneity is much weaker. The answer, of course, as you all like to hear, because most of your researchers, is more research is needed. Don't tweet that. Okay, <laughs> more research is needed because that's the way in which you will get more studies to include in your reviews to really understand what program designs work for who and so on. Um, nurse family partnership example where we looked at heterogeneity, why is it working in the US, not in the UK, actually using qualitative reasoning. So you can use qualitative reasoning to look at heterogeneity too. But more research needed, that's the conclusion. Um, next stylized fact is that randomized controlled trials find smaller effects in experimental designs. Generally, the more rigorous, sorry, non-experimental non designs, the more rigorous the design, the smaller the effect. So before versus after studies, which is not a rigorous design, it's just outcome monitoring, which we would not include in a review, will find a big effect. Once you start trying to do some sort of comparison group, the effect gets smaller. Once you really control for selection bias by instrumental variables, randomization, or natural experiment, the effect is smaller still. And there's an example from review of um, int interventions for small and medium enterprises, but it's a common finding in Campbell reviews. They disaggregate by the, the quality of the primary study, and you find the higher quality studies find smaller effects. Oh, here's an example from a Campbell review custodial versus non custodial sentences. Should you put people in prison, or can you give them community-based sentences instead? How does that affect reoffending, recidivism? And randomized controlled trials find there's no difference. Give people community-based or a prison sentence has no effect whether they reoffend or not. Okay, which is good because community-based sentences are cheaper, they're better for the offender's family and so on, more stability, more likely to retain employment and not lose their family and so on. But so but there's no difference in reoffending rates. The Non-experimental studies, mostly Francisco matching, actually suggest that community-based sentences reduce the risk of reoffending. They're actually better than sending people to prison. But the authors of the review say it's like there's still some selection bias we've not managed to control for. Because judges sentencing might well sentence on observe unobservables, thinking those more likely to reoffend, they send to prison, those less offend they give the custodial sentences, and if we can't remove that selection bias fully, which PSM can't, it's based on unobservables, then it's still present, so we get a biased effect like this. So the authors of the review say, really we, we trust the RCT evidence, not the non-experimental evidence. Um, and, oh, I, talk, I already talked about this, I went ahead of myself. So exploding heterogeneity gets down at design implementation issues. So here's what I mentioned about conditional cash transfers, and the graph shows the conditions matter and monitoring enforcement conditions matters. So actually, a child living in a community where they have a CCT that's properly monitored and enforced is 60% more likely to go to school than a child living in a community with an unconditional cash transfer. Makes a huge difference to the impact on enrolments. Similarly, in food, food supplementation, food supplementation does improve nutrition, but the effect is much bigger if the program is properly targeted and if it's properly supervised to ensure there's no leakage or, substitu or substitution of the, the food supplement. So basically, the message there is implementation matters. And one of the trends at Campbell is to pay much more attention to implementation issues by doing theory-based causal chain reviews or simply doing reviews of implementation, implementation reviews that pull together the evidence from process evaluations. 
Um, I think I'm coming to the last lesson. I forget how many there are. There seems to be a lot. Um, there are enormous evidence gaps everywhere. As many of you know, that 3i has been producing evidence and gap maps for some years, and Campbell is starting to publish them now. And here's an example of the youth and transferable skills evidence and gap map. Which, um, and what we see basically, well, you can't see it very well, probably, like me. So there's not much there, basically. You could see it. There's lots of gaps in the evidence. There's uh, missing studies. So again, more research needed. More primary studies doing the same thing as someone already did is actually a good thing. So leading academics in developed countries don't want to do that. But if you've got a, a similar program, women's empowerment program, market finance program, whatever, that's been tested somewhere else, test it again in your context. We need more studies testing similar programs in different contexts. We need more and better reviews. I'm glad that so many of you here are coming to the Campbell workshops and engaging with us in producing reviews. We need to fill the Campbell Library. The Cochrane Library has 7,000 reviews. The Campbell Library has 140. We need to be overtaking Cochrane 10 years from now, or if not sooner. We just need more reviews. And there's lots of scope for doing methods development, particularly on the qualitative synthesis, to be able to do it better, to know that it's really rigorous and reliable. The take-home message is you want to use rigorous evidence of effectiveness. Use high-quality reviews. Don't use low-quality reviews. Assess global evidence, but test it locally. Remember, evidence-based policy is not a blueprint approach. And build institutions for use of evidence. I think it's the key one for this audience is that's not happening here. We're doing reviews in a vacuum in India. If you haven't got the infrastructure in place outside of health to some extent, in order to be able to use those reviews. We want to create that demand for evidence from rigorous reviews here in, in, in India and Delhi and down in the states, capitals, in Hyderabad and Mumbai and so on. Okay, thank you everybody. Visit our website, sign up for our newsletter.